All right, let's let's jump in with um, uh, Galen. Uh, Galen, if you're ready to get started, we have your slides too. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you. So a uh, fair amount of the material that I had prepared is uh, maybe a little obsolete after that wonderful presentation and video by Laddie and company. Uh, but let me share my screen here. It is not, not obsolete. It's just a reinforcement of that that narrative. So don't feel that your uh, your content isn't equally as valuable uh, right now as it was 15 minutes ago. I had no worries. No worries. So I'm with uh, Dr. John Freeman at Intrinsics Environmental, and our company really focuses on using plants and specialized microbes uh, to do phytoremediation and water and wastewater treatment. So, you know, this, <clears throat> there are so many opportunities in the uh, Trace Lagunas and Salton Sea area to implement uh, phytoremediation and different forms of uh, natural treatment systems. We're, I think we're all familiar with the sources of contamination coming from uh, agriculture, from <clears throat> treated and poorly treated uh, municipal wastewater, uh, <clears throat> stormwater runoff from impacted areas and industry and, and even more. So our, our approach is really multidisciplinary. And we try to pull in, uh, because natural systems are so complex, uh, we, we need to pull in a lot of expertise from, from different, different fields and different people. And so we have a, a large network of collaborators uh, as well as our own core team. A lot of the work that we've done in the past uh, focuses, has focused on phytoremediation of uh, inorganic pollutants. Uh, as well as organic pollutants. But these are some examples of, of plants that are specialized to pull out different constituents. Uh, the ones to highlight here are uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium uh, with this, this hyperaccumulated in a pure grass that also puts on biomass very quickly. Uh, we also have selenium hyperaccumulators. And we adapt these, this history of uh, terrestrial fighter mediation into uh, our approach to wastewater treatment and water treatment as well. So I, I just want to say a little more about resifiltration, which is you know largely what the, uh, the prior talk was about. Um, but it, you know the three the three components that we design with are, are having a porous substrate. Uh, and a good substrate has really high surface area and is inexpensive, which the floating island system by floating islands West and International definitely fits that bill. Uh, but there are other other natural substrates, and they don't have to be floating. Uh, plants we choose plants that are high biomass, so ones that grow very quickly, and high, and also hyperaccumulators. And in the when habitat is a concern, we we search for ones that are native to the zone that we're implementing in. And uh, the, real, the real linchpin or kingpin here is the, the microbes, uh, as previously discussed, especially in the biofilms and perifoton, but also endophytes inside, living inside the plants themselves. And all of these uh, work together to uh, help the plants grow, be more effective, and provide uh, increased treatment effect. And so we we design our systems to to take these factors into account and try to maximize the effect for each each water quality target. I I really like this picture of essentially uh, rhizofiltration at work. You get to see underwater uh, little particulates and colloids being trapped on the biofilm 
the sticky surface that's coating each of these roots that is you know too small to see here but uh, you can see in this lower left corner that there's a lot of solids collecting uh, on the surface that just readily come off when those roots are removed you can see them on the, the person's glove so you know our approach to water treatment is really that in wastewater are that these are re resources that are uh, important uh, for both human and environmental uses to be protected reused and managed in the most in the holistic way possible low low impact and high effect so uh, the, the components here are porous substrate specialized uh, plants microbial inoculants uh, and various uh, sorry the and rise of filtration so for for the Salton sea area uh, I believe there's you know a variety of approaches that could be taken for some of the other smaller uh, inlets, but for the, the main inlets of Alamo and New Rivers, the floating wetlands are really the the key choice. Uh, we've you know there are a lot of plants that are native to Southern California that could be used as well as uh, salt tolerant willows and, and hybrid poplars, which grow very quickly. These plants can be used for a variety of purposes for biomass production, uh, for, <clears throat> for agricultural feed, for composting. Um, I mentioned the pier grass earlier, which is a nitrate and phosphate hyperaccumulator. I'll talk about it a little more in a minute. Um, but uh, native halophytes can withstand quite high salt levels and these can be very useful in further out in the transition zone for creating habitat in more salty areas so this is a, on the right is a picture of a pilot we have going this is two months after planting and this water is i'm going to say kind of similar to the water in in uh the oh, inlets from the alamo and new rivers uh, this is concentrated wastewater uh, so it's very high in nutrients it's high in salts uh, high in some some dissolved heavy metals and the goal here is to pull out as much as possible and uh, create a thriving uh, subsurface microbial community on those roots and in the portions of platform below water. Uh, the, the tall grass here, which has grown about six feet in two months, uh, is the Napier grass or Penicetum purpureum. And it will accumulate uh, nitrate and phosphate up to 30,000 ppm, so about 3% by weight. And this can be harvested in a short cycle and composted for a really high nutrient uh, fertilizer that also adds carbon material back into the depleted agricultural lands and the more carbon there is in the soil uh, the, the less phosphate and nitrate that leaches out as it's irrigated uh, carbon in the soil also really helps with salt mitigation and tolerance to salt by, by agricultural plants So the next uh, main component of our, our system are the endophytes and specialized microbes. And we use a set of unique uh, endophytes uh, developed by Dr. Sharon Doty at University of Washington. Uh, that has been working on this for, for decades. And these endophytes help, the, help plants in a variety of ways, but they provide tolerance to salts, they provide tolerance to uh, different contaminants and they break down and degrade uh, different contaminants. Some of these endophytes help with phosphate uh, mobilization into the plants, so through the roots and 
uh, help increase uptake. And some of them break down oil and gas, as we mentioned earlier, as Jonathan was talking about uh, his impressive pilot working on uh, oil and gas spill. Uh, these endophytes can be inoculated or used to inoculate plants and trees, and they use oil and gas compounds as their preferred and primary carbon source, so degrading them uh, permanently. Similar, similar to uh, different fungi, such as the ones uh, from Paul Stamets that they used, but also degrade uh, oil and gas compounds uh, as, a, as a food source. So in general, there's, there's a whole bunch of different types of engineered natural treatment features that we could, that I could see deploying different, different zones uh, to achieve different uh, goals, both treating the water that's there and preventing additional contaminants from running off uh, different areas into the water that feeds into the Salton Sea and other, other water bodies in the region. And the, one of the benefits of in-situ treatment is that uh, water quality is improved year-round. So put in the floating wetland system and you know whether you check on it or add add aeration or, or any inputs whatsoever, they will still be there uh, improving water quality and providing habitat regardless. But there are also stormwater and flood control uh, features such as bioswales and engineered stream beds uh, and horizontal levees or uh, I guess if you're not familiar with the term horizontal levee, it's a, a stream bank or uh, lake bank or uh, a flood control feature that allows water to pass through it underneath through a porous substrate and uh, the top is planted with with different uh, trees and plants and as water moves through this porous substrate it is it is treated uh, and this system has been very effective at degrading and removing uh, metals, nutrients, and and other contaminants from from wastewater. So the key the key tre treatment effects are removal of suspended solids. So settling rates are increased and the sticky biofilms on the roots and the, the porous substrate or platforms adheres and absorb, absorbs uh, particulates and colloids. So very, very small particles get taken up. Uh, and that includes bacteria. So bacteria are also removed at a significant rate from these systems. Nutrients are one of the keys, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, heavy metals, uh, are most often associated with particulate matter. And so that increased settling and removal of particulates also increases a, a large portion of heavy metals in stormwater and in other water bodies and organic contaminants. So uh, with the endophytes, we can degrade uh, pHs, oil and gas compounds, volatile organic compounds, uh, aromatics, chlorinated organics, uh, including solvents and other other things of that nature. So I want to include this uh, one case study here at the end because it's a really good example of how these floating wetland projects can provide multiple benefits. So this is a installation in Singapore. And they created this education and recreation and habitat uh, area uh, on a, and they have a, a nature walk that goes partly on this. And that, the next picture shows it after it's grown in. Um, but it not only, you know, provides treatment to the water 
uh, underneath, which is which is stormwater fed. Uh, Singapore, if you're not familiar, is a small island, and they have a one water approach that really incorporates uh, use and reuse and careful management of all the water. So on the island, uh, so they they move water around and they treat it very as a very precious commodity, and they they put that approach in their education system from primary school on uh, that water is is an important part of part of their island and, and protecting it and reusing it is uh, is an important part of that education system. So you know this is after uh, this area has grown out and uh, they use it as you know a an outreach tool but you know these these can you know be both productive by adding uh, you know biofuel crops on floating islands, uh, crops that are designed for, you know, such as napier grass and poplars and willows, which can be composted and improve local agricultural lands at the same time as provide water quality. But they can also be used, you know, as uh, Laddie and Bruce were saying in their video, as, you know, pure habitat restoration features, which improve water quality. So planted with natives, planted with uh, species that are going to improve the habitat and provide uh, food and shelter for fish and and migratory birds and local local waterfowl. And they can be you know successful in, in very large scale. So you know the, the big challenges here that we see are you know water quality and primarily water quality in the New River and Alamo uh, coming in, but also through other areas, other inlets to the Salton Sea. And the, the key opportunities here are, are those inlet areas where the salinity is lower and the contaminants are more concentrated, uh, so that we have uh, more treatment effect for what we put in. And the gray infrastructure, you know, traditional treatment alternatives have some significant drawbacks. Uh, large capital investment that can take years and years to design and construct. They require a lot of specialized expertise and uh, money to maintain, and they can leave public agencies with, you know, large, large debt. Whereas a lot of natural treatment alternatives provide these multiple benefits of, you know, they can be, they provide water treatment, they can be nurseries for, for trees, uh, for terrestrial plantings, they can uh, produce biomass, habitat, recreation, education, and <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so, with that, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity to talk to you guys, and uh, I'd love to hear more from the audience about what uh, what are some of these key challenges that that we're facing. Because I'm in gen I'm more I'm familiar with the Salton Sea and the New River, but not as much with other issues faced by the whole region and I think that there's a lot of opportunities here for synergies uh, in the approach and and solutions that we might come up with. Yeah maybe maybe I'll start with that so you know a big question was species selection um, you know in some of those questions it might be like a grass species um, or a tree species so maybe we can touch on that real quick. Yeah um so i think de it depends on on what the goal is so there's there's a few species that we would suggest for you know say making a, a mix that'll take out nitrogen phosphate or nitrogen phosphorus and be useful for say a, a composting system so the napier grass uh hybrid poplar and some willows that are 
salt tolerant. They work really well together. They grow incredibly fast and they can be coppiced uh, regularly and sprout back and grow uh, in a phenomenal rate. So uh, for you know, selenium removal, uh, there are other species, um, the brassica family primarily, that would be very, you know, could be grown on islands or terrestrial areas, you know, bordering, uh, bordering New River or Alamo River. And they pull out selenium at a, at a really incredible rate and hyperaccumulate it so they can be harvested uh, and they convert the selenium. Uh, but John Freeman is going to be on uh, next and he will, he is a selenium expert. So I'm going to let him talk about that one. Yeah. Um, well, well, what you did, Galen, is um, I think really important. And you talked briefly about some of those financial mechanisms again, right? The financial mechanism of maybe a biofuel production. Some of these grasses, I, I, would assume can be processed into an ethanol or something like that. Maybe you can talk about that real quick. Um, yeah, both the hybrid poplars and the napier grass can be used for, for biofuel. Uh, and we have, uh, I think John might touch on that a little bit in the next talk as well, but uh, we have done studies uh, to characterize, you know, what rates uh, you can get per acre of planted uh, napier grass, for instance, uh, for for biofuel production. That'll always kind of take us back to that same question: How do projects get in the ground, right? And that that becomes a part of it. If if there's a financial mechanism of recouping some capital. Um, obviously, that can't take place until the production has been in operation for some time. So that always becomes where we can bring a project forward and where we can find that match funding uh, to get it off the ground. Uh, if there was something that was less arduous than a grant process, um, that would be an ideal scenario. Uh, but that's where hopefully there could be some reimbursement agreements down the road with some of these local agencies once we can install a system that is proven, uh, you know, that would be an idea way to get projects in the dirt or in the water, um, show that they're viable solution and prove their contextual relationship to the region and take it to the next step of uh, deploying that system at scale at a commercial scale of, you know, potentially the, the length of the new river. I mean, how much, how much would that cost? How much would it treat? Uh, but that seems to be the, a lower cost solution than a mechanical wastewater treatment facility that is hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's still some, yeah, I mean, there's, there's always a lot of work to be done in that field. Uh, Galen, I do have one question for you. Yeah, please. How does, in ranking, let's say, for selenium, or excuse me, <laughs> four part per thousand salinity up to, let's say, 30 or 40 part per thousand salinity. Yeah. How does that affect your biological diversity and efficacy in regards to salinity of water versus efficacy and productivity of your systems? Uh, that's a really good question. So, it definitely affects uh, species choice. So certain species we can we have, have that we can work with up to you know thir around thirty five uh, parts per thousand. But um, in general, as salt goes up, uh, productivity goes down. And I would say above 30, 30 35 parts per thousand. Uh, the productivity starts to go down significantly. Um, you know, up until about 10 parts per thousand, we have really robust uh, productivity. And then it sort of 
based on species selection and you know the impact of salt to primary productivity, it gently goes down over from 10 to about 30 or 35, and then it more steeply goes down over that. Does that help? It's really qualitative, but uh, does that help answer that question? Yes, thank you. Just putting something in the chat here that somebody shared with us on Facebook, um, a congressional report about the Salton Sea. If anybody's interested in reading that technical paper later, thank you for sharing that online. Um, great. Well, this was an amazing conversation. I love uh, that we're getting started with that. And um, uh, stay here, Galen. Um, I'm sure both you and John can kind of participate um, in conjunction. We'll let uh, John come up um, as the co-host, and I'll pin him too. How you doing, John? Well, can you hear me? Uh, we can. Yeah, it's a little muted, so maybe um, I don't know if you just want to turn.